lot of the passages we chant here are designed to induce a sense of sangwega, a sense of awe at the huge mess we've got ourselves entangled in, coupled with a sense of urgency to try to find a way out. Without that sense of sangwega, it's difficult to practice. Because where is the door out? Well, you have to go through the present moment. What do we find when we look, sit down and look at the present moment? There's pain, there's suffering, there's distraction. The mind doesn't <clears throat> like to focus on the present. It's always finding reasons to focus someplace else. It keeps deceiving itself. Think about this, think about that. A thought comes in, instead of looking at it simply as an event in the present moment, we're programmed to Think of it as a sign pointing away someplace else, and so we follow the arrow of the sign, always veering off away from the present. We either find the present boring or painful, not that attractive a place to stay. That's the door that we have to go through, and unless we have a really good sense of why we want to go through the door, it's hard to even think about it. So we have the chant, like the chant in the morning on the three characteristics of the two chants we had just now. The world is insufficient, insatiable, a slave to craving. It has nothing of its own. It's swept away. It does not endure. And then the reflections on aging, illness, and death. and separation, followed by the passage that gives a glimmer of hope, where the heirs to our actions. But even that is kind of scary. We'd like to be delivered out of our pain and misery without having to do much effort on our, on our own part. <clears throat> but it simply doesn't work that way. It's our own lack of skill that has us entangled here, and so we're going to have to develop skill to get out, and nobody else can de develop skill for us something that each of us has to do. So the, the Buddha devised ways for bringing us into the present so it's not that scary, so that we're not overwhelmed by what we encounter here. At the same time, he sets fire to the bridge behind us, so we don't want to turn around and go back. So look at what's ahead. Pain. What are you going to do with pain? Well, first he gives us breath meditation as a way of giving the mind a comfortable place to stay in the present moment. You can create a sense of comfort, even if it's a, only a little tiny space to begin with. Work on a little tiny space. When breath comes in, try to make it come in comfortably. When it goes out, allow it to come in, go out comfortably. Whatever way you have of relating to the breath, it makes it feel good just to be with the breathing coming in, going out right here in the present. Take that approach to the breath. This gives you a beachhead. So there is something to hold on to in the present moment that's interesting, that's pleasant, a good place to stay. Then it gets you interested in the present. How does the breath relate to the other sensations in the body? And when the breath starts feeling good, you start spreading that sense of good breath energy throughout the different parts of the body. You find that you run into a pain here or a sense of blockage there. Well, think of the breath as being fine enough or refined enough to seep right through that sense of blockage, that sense of pain, and see what that does. This gives you a new way to approach the pains that you may encounter while you're sitting here. In other words, instead of trying to run away from them or trying to push them away, you open up that knot of blockage around them and let the breath energy flow through. And many times that actually improves the situation. Often, too, often, too often we're afraid to open that up. We think we've got the pain locked away, at least we've got it under control, it can't spread beyond there. We're afraid that if we open up that little shell of hardened energy around the pain, that the pain will start slipping out like mercury, running all over the body. 
So put aside that fear and just allow yourself to breathe right through the pain. Once you've got this, one, the sense of ease that comes from being with the breath, and two, the sense that you've got a tool here that you can use. You're, it changes the balance of power. You're not so afraid of the pain. You're willing to look into it to see what exactly it is you're doing to the pain that turns it into suffering. We think that anywhere there's a pain, there's automatically got to be suffering. But the Buddha said, no, the connection is not automatic. From the pain, from the feeling, we have to go through craving and clinging in order to get to the suffering. And so we sit with the pain and watch to see where that craving and clinging are. This means being willing to sit with pain. So you've breathed through the area around the pain, but there's still a painful <coughs> feeling there. This means you have to be willing to, willing to sit with it for a while. If you keep changing positions or running away from it, you never get to really understand the pain. We're not here to torture ourselves, but we are here to learn from the pain. What does the pain have to teach us? Well, one, for one thing, a lot of interesting discussions come up in the mind around the pain. We're often too involved in them to notice them. Making comments on the pain, don't like the pain, why the hell do I have to sit here with, with this pain? Why can't we, we be more relaxed about it? All these comments the mind makes up. Fear that you're going to harm yourself, cutting off the circulation to your legs, you're going to go numb, and after you go numb then you're going to get paralyzed. The mind has all sorts of stories it makes up around the pain. And the trick is to get out of that conversation and just watch it see what commentary comes to the pain. It's like going to a salt lick. Animals out in the forest all need salt, but there are very few places where there is salt available for them. And where it is available, places where there's salt on the surface of the ground, you get the animals from all over coming. You don't have to, if you want to see the animals in a particular section of the wilderness, just go to the salt lick. And everybody in the immediate area is going to have to come at some point or another. So instead of having to wander around looking for them, you just stay there at the salt lick and they all come. The pain functions the same way. All the different committee members of the mind are eventually going to come here and have their say. And if you can learn to step back and look at them, that gives you your chance. This ability to step back and look, that's equanimity. Learn to develop some equanimity around the pain. Just watch it for a while and see what happens. Instead of jumping in and passing judgment right away, you want to watch things for a while to really understand them before you make your choices. It's interesting that that passage we chanted just now, the one on the five recollections and the other one on the sublime attitudes, in the Five Recollections, the reflection on karma is the reflection that offers hope. There is a way out of the suffering of aging, illness, and death. And under the Sublime Attitudes, we have pretty much the same passage, reflection on karma, and that's equanimity. Equanimity is what offers us hope. We can watch what's going on in the present moment and learn from it to the point where we work ourselves free. Equanimity isn't indifference, it's just the ability to sit and watch. Nudge things a little bit here, nudge them a little bit there, watch again. Because because it's in the watching and the looking, that's when you really see that. That's how you gain your insight. That's the way out. Through the insight, there comes release. Release from what? Release from those old habits of taking pain and turning into suffering. Release from those old habits of being unwilling to look at the present moment, trying to run away, veer off every chance you get which leaves the pain untouched. It's still there. It's simply that we're trying to turn a blind eye to it. But when you turn a blind eye to things, it doesn't go away. So remember that the way out will lie through the pain. And again, it's not that we're, we have to suffer in order to get out. You're sitting here with a pain. The question should be, okay, why is there suffering? The Buddha says it's not necessary. Remember the Suffering of the Four Noble Truths and the Dukkha and the Three Characteristics are two different things. 
three characteristics apply to everything. That's simply the way they are. Everything that's fabricated has to be in constant stress when not self. But the stress that comes from craving, clinging, that's not necessary. So you sit with the pain until you get fed up with creating suffering around the pain and are willing to look at your own actions to see how you could do things differently, how you could relate in a different way. So that's the motivation we have here. The, the Sangwege helps remind us that we've got to go through the pain. The breath meditation gives us the tools we need in order to get there. So we can develop that state of real equanimity around the pain. All too often when we deal with pain, there's the unspoken of agenda. We've got to get rid of it. got to get rid of it as fast as possible. But when you work with the breath, you finally can get to that state of equanimity in what they call the four last tetrads of those 16 steps, where you're just watching. So you can really see inconstancy, stressfulness, not self. See all the way through to dispassion, to cessation, and finally to total letting go. There is a way out. The door may be difficult, but the Buddha gives us our magic bullet, our magic instructions that will get us through. And as I said, at the same time, he keeps lighting the bridge behind us so we don't get tempted to turn back when the going gets difficult. Because it's when we're cornered like this, that's when we really get, get intelligent, start getting ingenious. <laughs>